Greetings, everyone. This is Caroline Staten with Transition US, and thank you so much for joining our online event today. Our principal aim uh, with these teleseminars is to provide practical support to the leaders of transition initiatives, those mulling over starting an initiative, and community leaders far and wide who are working on resilience building within their communities. Let me go now to, um, to our call today, um, to our wonderful guest, Mark Lakeman. And Mark is a national leader in the development of sustainable public places. I've been following Mark's work for years um, in Portland. And in the last decade, Mark has directed or facilitated designs for more than 300 new community-generated public spaces in Portland, Oregon alone. Through his leadership in Communitecture, Inc., and uh, its nonprofit affiliate, the City Repair Project, he has also been instrumental in the development of dozens of participatory design projects and organizations across the United States and Canada. And Mark works with governmental leaders, community organizations, and educational institutions in many diverse communities. And I'm really grateful, Mark, that you've um, joined us today. And just before um, we, we opened this call, Mark and I were having a conversation about sort of the um, how action-oriented uh, the city repair work is and, and how much it has to offer to the transition movement and transition initiatives as wonderful possibilities for um, some of the initiatives to move into um, working on uh, similar projects in their locales. So lots to learn from you, Mark, and thank you so much again for joining us, and welcome. Well, thanks, Carolyn. It's really wonderful to be asked to be part of this conversation and to contribute in some way. I really appreciate it. I think that um, I'm just kind of thinking about how many people become frustrated. Uh, they have all these ideas. I, like most of the people I've met in the transition movement are naturally integrative uh, people. They they tend to take the things that they're seeing and learning and roll them around and evaluate them and then try to put them into a bigger picture um, to try to understand what's happening in the world. And um, I'm certainly like that, and I feel always very fortunate when I'm able to to share um, stories of our experiences and our mostly our success stories uh, and, of course, our hard lessons as well. But um, it's really it's kind of humbling to be able to be given the chance, so thank you for that. Um, but I don't know, that sort of brings up one of our core strategies um, before I really get into the presentation. Uh, I like to think that everything we're doing is creating stories that are worth telling um, and maybe even motivational enough to people to inspire them to get off the couch um, or just to feel some amount of more, more hope um, so that they might become, uh, I don't know, so that they could come maybe from feeling like nobody cares or nobody's doing anything to realize that people are doing things and, then, and that directly doable, enactable solutions are easy at hand and that help is around them, uh, which is certainly what City Repair is about. I mean, I can remember back at the beginning of our movement, I think in the mid-'90s, um, there were quite a few of us, I would call us slacktivists, really, or activists would sort of sit around talking about the disparaging stories of the day, reading the negative stories of the newspaper, and um, sitting around on the avenue till very late in the morning having coffee and just sort of, um, you know, enjoying the moment, but um, not feeling like we could especially do anything about the state of the world. And at a certain point in that culture of slacktivists, um, which of which I was a part. Um, we actually did start to consider what we might be able to do about it. And just by spending a half an hour talking, um, just sort of kicking around ideas about how we might try to change the world, we actually hit upon um, a series of just really excellent kind of, I don't know, design constraints, I suppose, that helped us to understand that the conditions were ripe, actually, for us to be able to do something. 
one of the things we realized is that um, you know there's never going to be enough world uh, enough money in the world to do the things that we have to do. Fortunately, we're now understanding broadly across the society that there's other forms of capital besides just money. And we thought, okay, well, one of the givens of the of the revolution that we seek is that people have to be able to act wherever they are with whatever they have. You know, right now, there's not going to be any waiting for him for more resources. The best of presidents won't be able to um, sort of through the ordinary processes of deliberation, negotiation, and resource allocation. There won't be enough, and we're not structurally set up to do all that has to be done. There has to be a breaking of the dam and unleashing of the community at every scale in order to do the things we've got to do, but also to stop doing the things that we no longer should be doing at the same time. Um, I think most of the listeners know what I'm talking about. But let's let's go to Portland, Oregon. I, I'm hoping that people are looking at the slides of uh, that I, I sent in for us to um, have to accompany this discussion today. Um, the first couple of slides should be looking at um, an image of a statue and then a diagram on the right. I, I, I'm, there's only two diagrams in this whole presentation, so it shouldn't be shouldn't put you guys to sleep. But the first the first image is of Portlandia, and many of you have probably seen this internet comedy about Portland, Oregon, um, and you know, f starring some uh, Saturday Night Live performers. Um, well, this is an image of Portlandia. One of the things that that comedy hasn't really explained is that Portlandia is actually the name of our, the goddess of Portland, whose face is on the um, great seal of the city. And uh, this is significant. Um, I don't really care about an internet comedy show, but there's something going on in Portland that's helping us to be, for instance, the only major city where citizen participation is increasing and whereas in all other American cities it's actually in decline. Um, sometimes just precipitously people are abandoning civic processes of involvement. They're not going to the city council to speak. They're sort of giving up and receding back into their stress, their compression, or you know just whatever's happening in their daily lives, trying to hold it together. Um, but somehow in Portland things are increasing and it's not because we're all so wealthy we have enough time on our hands. Um, there's a lot of reasons for it but I'm going to say a bit about it. But this lady right here um, is actually an emblem that is the symbol of Portland, and she stands for an ethic of service, and also she stands for the idea um, of community and of, of, of local ownership. And I think, um, you know, whether you're saying that Portland, Oregon has an actual goddess or trying to account for it in some other way, like our um, amazing civic infrastructure, that decentralizes power and basically makes five mayors rather than just one strong mayor. There's a lot of things going on here which are um, marvelous, but all of which have been done by the people who live here because they decided it was important. And um, I don't know, I'll just say, for me as a little kid, I used to ride in my dad's car. He was the founder of um, the Urban Design Division of the Bureau of Planning in Portland. He would come home at the end of the day in his little green city car, and on the side of the car was the face of the goddess of Portland. And uh, that was about the time that the show Batman came out. And, of course, Batman had a bat on the side of his car. And as a little kid, I thought, yeah, well, we've got a goddess. You know, we must be superheroes, too. This is our town. You know, they'd send out a signal to call Batman, and my dad was always coming and going. So I was thinking, well, he must be kind of like Batman, and I'm his little, his little son or something that is part of the action. So I grew up thinking that Portland was my town, I think I got kind of lucky with that. And, and I'm, the reason I'm telling you this story is because I think it's something that everyone can choose. They can choose to identify so strongly with their place that they can say, I am my place. My place is me. And I, I'm certainly coming from that orientation. I mean, some of the things that we've done to get to think, you know, things started here in Portland included civil disobedience and just brazenly b breaking the law. And if you stand there, and you don't just stand there, but you stand there with a look in your eyes and a tone in your voice and choosing certain words that basically express, you know, no, 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 I am the place-based community. You know, and not you alone, but everyone you're standing with has that attitude. Um, you can do things that you never thought were possible. So, you know, when we seized a street intersection illegally and took it over and painted the surface of the street and built all these 
interactive features around the corner to basically mock up the vitality, the functional vitality of a village. And we did it, the neighbors, us, who lived there. The police showed up and they were like, well, this is the coolest thing ever. It's totally illegal, but you're getting along. Um, that's really rare. <laughs> we're always called to places where people are fighting and you're not, so we're not even going to report you. Um, you know, that sort of thing starts to happen. Um, but that was kind of part of our plan, actually. We wanted to engage not just the absence of place. You know, we wanted to take this, the space in between our homes, a typical street intersection, and turn it into a gathering place that would bring us together because we recognized that there was no such place in our community. And somehow this sense of rootedness, this sense, this idea that the city is ours and we are the city, enabled us to do that. And it helped the police and the Transportation Bureau and the city council to recognize that we should have some authority and we should certainly have a gathering place. And they not only didn't report us, um, the whole thing was legalized within a short time for everyone in the city to be able to do. So Portland's quite a remarkable place, but it's not very different from other places. It's actually rather similar. Let's go on to the um, next image. So these uh, floating lobes around um, sort of a central circle that's broken into three parts saying equity, ecology, and economy. Each of those vectors is talking about um, the primary forms of capital. I'm just bringing this up again and connecting it to community building and this ethic of service or this sort of sense of civic identity that has to do with ownership and self-empowerment. Um, we're fortunate in Portland to have a, a wonderful think tank, progressive think tank, that's interested in sustainable and bioregional economics. Um, basically, this diagram has come to us through their studies and their interviews, particularly with indigenous people in the bioregion. And all that is really being said here is that if you focus on social capital, um, these other forms of capital will begin to flow. People will share their natural capital. Um, they'll steward the natural capital and the environment around them. And then in the end, they won't need much in the way of economic capital, which are the lobes down below. And the whole thing will spin like a wheel if your primary focus is engendering relationships and networks, um, between, you know, not just between people, but between every element in the landscape, in the, in the community. And of course, for, for Native people, that includes mythologizing and seeing the landscape as a great story of which, you know, of which they're an integral part. So that's our strategy, not just in the work that I'm going to be talking about today in city repair, but actually in the city of Portland. And it's become such a deeply held cultural value that we don't even necessarily have a common language for talking about it. It's, it's more like you just see people deciding to undertake ridiculously you know, interesting and fruitful things, in many cases highly profitable things. But they're doing it because they love this place. They're trying to enhance this place. They're trying to add a new, a new dynamic to it. So kind of before I go any farther, um, some of the things you're going to see today as we go through this presentation uh, are not emotionally geared toward, more, they're not more emotionally geared toward abating destruction than they are creating uh, and manifesting a forward impulse that is so dynamic and exciting that it, it attracts more people with every cycle of activity and it inspires replication, not just across Portland, but in many other cities now, in the, in, especially in the North American continent, but now in other countries. It's this formulation of a kind of activism that's not waiting around. You know, you're basically saying, all right, well, rather than asking for permission, we're going to initiate and recreate the landscape right where we're living, not just you know, out in the public right-of-way between our homes, but actually on the landscape where our homes are situated, within the property lines. And perhaps we'll put in gates or pathways, common pathways, or perhaps we'll take down fences and put in common amenities, gardens, food forests, um, you know, in places of pleasure or gathering or, or co-creativity, like workshop spaces or something. So. Um, we're trying to inspire a re-examination and a reinvention, and we're not actually trying. It's just happening all the time. I'm uh, personally overwhelmed with uh, so many projects, I can't even believe it, that are of an activist vein, but that are also um, now um, very much of a professional and right livelihood kind of vein as well. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, let's see, that would be number two, looking at the giant sunflower in a street. Okay. 
this is one of the earliest um, intersection interventions in the city. I'm not trying to get everyone to sort of, well, it would be fine if everyone sort of ran around in the streets wildly, you know, painting the surface of the street, I suppose. I'm, I'm encouraging that. But um, I'm really wanting to take this seriously as an urban design kind of discussion for a second so everyone can have a, a sort of theory base for talking about this. Basically, what you're seeing is that the Sunnyside neighborhood decided to say, all right, well, let's take the logo of the neighborhood, the sunflower, and put it down in the street intersection and see if it will bring neighbors out to interact, to talk to each other, maybe to share food, turn off the street lights and have some movie nights, to have some community dances, and see what comes of all this. Um, and basically what's happening here, and we'll go into this a little bit more in a few minutes, but we realized that we live in this gigantic development grid that was laid out very quickly by real estate developers and politicians and bankers who really were not paying attention to the kind of cultural fabric that people require in order to live in a robust, enduring society that's characterized by you know, creative cultural development. Um, they laid out the housing tract, especially in the Western USA, you know, as vast, vast areas purely of housing. And more lately, of course, with the rise of automobiles and, um, you know, and, and, and oil extraction cultures um, to create landscapes that would enforce the need for an automobile. So you would have to dra drive long distances between where people live and where they work. Um, so that's more recent. But the grid itself is far more ancient than cars themselves. In fact, it existed before cars came into being. So what's going on here is people have realized that they live in a grid, and they're saying, well, gosh, there's no places here. Um, where are the gathering places? Where are the plazas or where are the public squares um, that people would have if they lived in villages? So what we've done is we've said, all right, let's look at the landscapes of our own ancestors that were characterized by a fabric of place, literally, where people's pathways would converge in the fabric of a village. There would be a gathering place. So we've said, all right, let's take village settlement patterns and lay them down over the patterns of the military grid that we live in, and then develop spaces and nodes that are expressive of a community participation process. So what you're looking at with the sunflowers, people are saying, well, this is our identity as the Sunnyside neighborhood. Let's put down a place that's spectacular. That'll encourage us to have a stronger sense of identification with each other and with our environment. It'll you know, encourage people to notice where they are, to slow their cars down, um, you know, to uh, become more livable and more walkable and more talkable because it'll start to inspire other activity, such as the trellises that you see around on the corners. There's also solar-powered cob kiosks for information, places to sit. There's a poetry plaza, a giant community sauna, and many, many things that are sort of radiating down the street in all directions from this. But um, one of the things that this offers the transition movement is a larger scale focus um, on, on community for sure. I think you could put it this way. You know, here we are with freedom of assembly, but in the United States, with the lowest number of outdoor gathering places of all first world nations, you could say, well, by God, you know, what, is, what good is freedom of assembly without a place to assemble? You know, if we're going to come together in common cause to transition, especially our cities, um, how are we going to do that if we're all individuated and thinking that we're alone in the world? So this is actually a way of bringing people together and practice to practice basic patterns. You know, we're so out of practice speaking publicly and listening. I mean, they say of Americans that we are more afraid of public speaking than we are of death. And we find very quickly within a few potlucks that whole, that whole uh, sort of state of our people um, is rolled back especially if they're kids present, especially if a bunch of, frankly, I have to say it this way, white male architects are not dominating the discussion, but it's more open-ended and inclusive of a broader diversity of people, especially um, you know, up and down the age spectrum. Uh, suddenly, ideas emerge, and the inherent capacity of people to employ metaphors, to come up with metaphors that express something about their history, um, and to creatively alchemize and, you know, to literally stack functions like we talk about in permaculture. So you not only get something functional, but you get it get something that's highly symbolic and exuberant and inspiring. So that's what's happening with this image. Um, they're reinventing the landscape. They're saying, wait, 
we live in a grid, my God. Um, we're isolated from each other, and the highest rates of violence in the world connected to social isolation are happening every day in our neighborhoods. Perhaps we should look at some of the great places of the world where people have expressed an impulse toward community and you know, toward a common, commonly held vision toward a sustainable destiny. Maybe we can take that idea and put it down in the midst of where we live. What the hell? Let's see what happens. Well, I can tell you the American Journal of Public Health has published studies of this particular intersection over time compared to control sites and found, indeed, people have become physically and mentally healthier. They actually participate with others. They don't feel so alone. They actually are physically healthier. They actually get outside and walk around more, partly because there are now destinations in the neighborhood to go visit and to take their friends to go see. So this is just, you know, some paint on the street, and suddenly people are seeing the world differently, which says something about how flimsy this construct, this unsustainable construct may, may actually be. Okay, next image. The kids on the right there painting the street. Uh, one of our favorite friends now in the Bureau of Transportation um, that's helping to coordinate these around the country and other cities now has said recently that nothing that he has ever seen in his life builds community like this stuff does. And I think, you know, I'm not surprised, um, but then I've been coming from a gut level about it the whole time. Like, you know, I just, I just know, personally, I just know that if people have a sense that they can do things you know, right outside their door with each other, that they'll probably start getting ideas about the rest of the world, you know, once they feel a little sense of power. Sometimes it's as simple as just learning how to say hello to somebody that you've never met before but who lives next door to you. Here you see them out in the streets. And, you know, there's a jillion things happening as you look at this image. There's obviously lots of kids in this, in this painting. One of the things that's happening for them is that they are getting an experience of being in a commons with other people, doing things that are creative. And for an American, that's quite a revolutionary act that would affect anybody, whether they were a so-called liberal or a conservative, um, especially if they were a child, to get this kind of clue that, you know, in spite of having a separate bank account and a separate social security number, maybe there is a larger identity. Um, so let's go on to the next slide, which should be, I suppose, number three by now. This is another intersection that was just painted. Um, you should be seeing, looking at a kind of spiral that represents the yellow brick road, but in spiral form. And um, this was an idea generated by kids. Uh, there's also giant dandelions, dandelion seeds painted in the streets. Um, that's about these seeds floating through the city, landing in other neighborhoods to sprout other intersections. There are literally dozens and dozens of these in Portland now, and hundreds of associated structures um, all around the city, like the little pavilion there on the corner with a cob bunch and bench under it. And you can see there's a living roof, but it's all made out of natural and recycled materials. And all the lawns that, you, you know, if you're looking at this image about 15 years ago, all you would see are lawns and bare asphalt. And now what you see are um, gardens, fruit trees, food forests, um, and lots of interactive stations. All around this intersection, there are these interactive features. A solar-powered tea station that's maintained by the neighbors. It's all free. Um, that roof over a community bench. There's another roof over a community bench. Over on the left, under the trees, there's a kid's clubhouse wrapped around a living tree. Moving around the intersection, there's an art and poetry museum. Um, at the top of the image, there's all these trading spaces where people have like a little marketplace function, um, a place for information, and then the community newspaper box is over there. A lot of cob around the intersection. Then there's a library, um, a little fountain bird bath, and, uh, and then all these other gardens. And then there's projects all around. Um, people torn up lar yards together to put in root crops that they share. They'll go into someone's yard who's not really doing anything there and just mowing it. And they'll say, well, we'll take over the maintenance of this and put in some food instead. Sometimes people paint each other's houses. Everybody's looking after each other's kids. They're actually employing each other. There's a doctor that everybody goes to see. There's a chef that everybody loves to have come out and cook for big community dinners. Um, you know, stuff like that. But a lot of local livelihood being seeded. But, you know, some, you know we're, we're understanding that we're living in this larger ecology. And in order of, to affect 
the ecology for us the leverage point has first of all been to put in the place that brings everyone together if we just try to do things piecemeal like let's put in a water catchment here at this house and hope that it catches on at another one you know or a gray water system at this house and hope that it can spread around you know and maybe somebody's thinking well I'll do it at my house oh, it'll be a little demonstration project and then people will pay me well if you don't have this sort of social epiphany how's everybody going to know what their ideas and skills and talents are you know so obviously we've done some resource mapping some inventories in the neighborhood but it's more through a social basis like you learn who you live among by sharing chocolate cake um, over a potluck out in the square right after you've done you know you're, you're done painting for the day painting the intersection let's see the next image to the right yeah there's Superman putting a um, it's an iconic image from the first issue of uh, Superman Action Comics, I think it was called, where Superman is smashing a car, but this time he's placing it into the mouth of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And this is overlaid over that spiral of the yellow brick road. So again, kids were coming up with this. They were saying, well, you know, we don't really like cars anymore, and they're burning fossil fuels, and dinosaurs obviously would be pissed about that, and Superman's always trying to help. So you know how it goes with a kid, um, you know, you're going to see stuff you've never seen before, most likely. So this is right in the middle of a street intersection, and uh, somewhat controversial, um, but not really. And this is basically just stamping brick patterns using kitchen sponges on sticks um, onto the asphalt. So it actually creates this amazing illusion that it's actually brickwork, but it's, um, it's really just a street intersection. For those of you that are worried about um, chips, paint chips, flaking off and going into the water um, ways nearby. Actually, uh, what we do is, in, in this case, in this intersection, there's a dry well under the intersection that collects everything, and, and, the, and the chips don't go to a stream. Um, and it's also latex, and we've had it tested, and it's relatively innocuous anyway, um, believe it or not, once it gets into a stream condition. but. Uh, in other neighborhoods where they don't have dry wells, we actually have uh, landscape filters, landscape cloth filters in the storm drains. So we're thinking about those things. And besides, all this stuff is kind of a ritual where people come out and they paint together. Um, the idea being that they'll tear up the street um, and put in raised convex permeable platforms. Um, anyway, let's go on to the next image, which should be people tearing up uh, a parking lot. And this is just to kind of emphasize that, you know, when it comes to um, a social movement, not everybody wants to do the same thing. Some people want to create. Some people want to be artistic. You know, and at the same time, frankly, we have these generations of high school football players that have been, you know, acculturated to smashing things. So you've got to have stuff to smash. We pretty much figure you've got to have some things to bust up. Um, like, you know, there are some people who will not get off the couch for painting the street. Um, I think in this presentation we have some mobile tea houses with giant butterfly wings that travel around the city, so I'll show you those. Some people won't even get off the couch to come see one of those, even if they're giving away free chocolate cake right in front of your house in the street. But there are people who are just waiting for the moment to be able to come outside and smash things, use big metal crowbars and sledgehammers. But the idea here is um, that you're seeing is our depave program, where we take up thousands of square feet a year of parking lots and hard surfaces uh, in order to put in gardens and playgrounds that are permeable. So um, that's what they're about here, and they're having a lot of fun doing it. Um, okay, let's see. The, the next image should be uh, of a huge kind of plan in the neighborhood. You're seeing a curve go through the neighborhood, which is a, uh, which is a train track carving through the grid and creating all these sort of trapezoidal and triangular spaces that are kind of contiguous. And that's actually a space in my neighborhood where um, for decades we've been trying to get something to happen. The Parks Bureau hasn't been too terribly motivated, which says a lot about you know, systemic problems right there. You've got power and intelligence alienated from the neighborhood. So it's not going to feel the same urgency. It's not going to feel the same issues. And even though they live in the same city and they're reading about climate change and food insecurity, um, if it's not their neighborhood, 
and it's not their social culture. They're not terribly motivated to do something. So we just finally said, all right, well, we're done waiting. Guess what? We're going to do this thing. We're going to take these three acres, three or four acres, and we're going to put, start putting in a landscape that encourages people to get out and move around, a park-like setting, but basically where everything will be edible with lots of nut trees in order to compensate for um, a serious dearth of, uh, you know, of, of certain essential nutrients that we can only get these days um, through fossil fuel supply chains. Um, so our neighborhood association president basically took it to the Parks Bureau and said, you don't understand. We're doing this, and you get to watch. We have all the skills and talents in this neighborhood right now. We've got disengaged kids stuck on technical, technological distractions, stuck on couches. We're going to get them off the couch and teach them how to prune a tree, how to plant a tree. We've got horticulturists everywhere. We've already got all this stuff being propagated across the neighborhood that we can put into the ground. We've got all this mulch being generated when we take down trees in the urban environment. We've got all the skills and talents that we that we need to essentially put this in, with a, in within a couple of weeks for nothing. And uh, we've got a green light now. At first they said, well, you can't do that. I mean, you always hear that. You could almost just stand there and say, we're going to do this. And then they'd say, you can't do that. And then you'd say, well, we're going to do this. And they could say, well, we're not, you're not going to, you, that's impossible, you can't. And maybe 25 times or so, they just can't say no anymore. I actually have this theory that somebody has to say no a certain number of times before something actually starts to happen in the world. Someone's saying no somewhere as we speak. Um, yeah, I think every initiative that we've undertaken in this city started off with somebody saying that it was impossible. Um, and I could go on and on with a list. Okay, the next image that we're going to look at is basically a drawing of the grid on the planet um, on a napkin. And that comes from that discussion of all the activists and slacktivists about um, about 15, 17 years ago, um, where we were talking about changing the world. And after about a half an hour, this was our strategy, and it was to say, here's all these city-scale city infrastructures imposed over the planet um, in, an in, in a network of communication, political interaction, and trade exchange. And at the same time as that's happening, we know that the most powerful motivating thing in the world is a story. So this node you're seeing on the napkin that's um, a circle of green indicates Portland, and the radiating green lines coming from it indicate that we are changing our own city in this overall planetary ecology, knowing that stories will be transmitted outward to inspire people to do the things that only they can do where they live. So, of course, local action to inspire systemic change in the overall network is the strategy, and I think that's you know, very parallel with the transition movement. Okay, the next image we're looking at is um, Global Climate reduction, Carbon Reduction Challenge. I know that people have different numbers, but this is the one that I'm working with. Um, this comes from my best friend who's one of the, um, one of the uh, directors of the Canadian Climate Change Initiative. Uh, he told me in 2009 we have 10 years to reduce our emissions by 90% across the planet, otherwise we are cooked. And for North Americans, the share is about 98% reduction. Now, in about seven years. Um, so, I don't know, Helen Caldicott was telling us in the mid-90s that um, our do-or-die year was 2003, so who knows for sure. But this is just to kind of get real. Um, obviously, we have to localize. Obviously, um, we have to stop basically creating waste as the, as the product of all of our exertions and expenditures of energy, um, and instead redirect our economy toward remediation and healing of ecologies immediately, um, and all sorts of quick action strategies. Thermal mass in urban environments, for instance, contributes a huge share to the problem. And simply by um, taking up that thermal mass in urban environments, we start to uh, contribute to addressing climate change, creating reflective surfaces, um, living ecologies where before there was just hard pan um, or asphalt, those sorts of things, of course. But <clears throat> immediate, immediate reduction in everybody's uh, emissions and behaviors um, is just of the, of the highest urgency right now. So we know this. Let's look at the next image um, of a town. This is just talking about succession for a minute, because in transition we should be talking about succession. Uh, 
The idea of succession, of course, is that change happens naturally over cycles of time, just as you watch a tree grow or just as you propagate something and eventually put it into the ground and watch it, watch it grow. And in a forest com community, we're used to knowing about the disruptions that happen where certain plants move in very quickly to start holding the soil together and they kind of reestablish the ecology and then over time through succession um, things grow, things are supplanted and you end up with more or less a stable kind of um, apex condition. <clears throat> in the urban environment, we sh I think we have every right to expect that cultural development would, would lead to increasing quality of life and maybe less work over time. At least that was the product promise of industrialism and modernism that turned out to be so false. Well, looking at this image in southern Germany, this is of a small town, and over a 19-year period, it goes from a place-based community at an intimate scale with strong, robust urban spaces and small businesses that are locally owned to being completely overwhelmed and destroyed. Um, let's, let's look at the succession as um, power and ownership has just been transferred to remote um, people who don't live in the community. So the next image shows a couple of years later where, where some of the fabric of the, of the village has started to be unmade. The little stream that was on the left um, has been paved. The public space in the center has been destroyed. It's nice that they're putting in transit, but at the same time there's this increase in automobile traffic and activity. The next image we are seeing really just the unmaking of the cultural investment that has been made over time by the people who live and work in the village. It's their village, really. They're the ones who built it. But now that ownership is held remotely and, and power has been corrupted, um, where maybe the city council has basically been supplanted by people who do the bidding of developers, now you can see that the public space is you know, really not meaningful at all anymore. They've had to dramatically stripe the streets in order to try to create safe ways to get across. All the small businesses are gone. Um, you know, and then the next image shows they've put a little carnival downtown to try to create some sort of vital activity. Um, meanwhile, buildings keep rising and fabric keeps being torn down until the final image where a freeway is literally plowing through what was the center of the town. And um, you know, this process you know, it's sort of succession in reverse, where over time, through the cycles of change that happens, things become increasingly dystopic as opposed to more human scale and more imbalance. Um, so, you know, as someone who is trained in modernism, okay, I understand the whole dogma and the promise, you know, that our lives were supposed to become easier. They even said to us at the beginning of the last century, in design culture and architecture schools. Oh, the machine for living, that will be the house. You know, it will be pre-manufactured and then it will liberate everyone to be, you know, free to pursue spiritual um, enlightenment, you know. And now we know um, quite the reverse. Um, we're, you know, undergoing just such compression and deterioration of the quality of life that we have um, as this process proceeds. Um, they should have told us the truth that we would never really be a, a co, co you know collaborators in how this would all play out instead it would be visited upon us in this kind of crazy gentrification so that all, that all happened over a 19 year span of time okay let's go on to the next image which should should be a bunch of circles connected by pathways well you know in the best of worlds this is a diagram of what we're transitioning to this is actually a diagram of the human village. I mean, for everyone who sees this diagram, I hope that you recognize that this is what home should look like. This is how a village is supposed to work. All the pathways lead to nodes of connection. Um, so the blue circles are where the pathways converge, because where your pathways converge, your lives come together, physically, literally. That's where the piazza or the plaza, you know, if you're Greek, it's the platea, or if you're French, it's the place, you know. This is where they're supposed to be located. There's supposed to be a nexus of connection where pathways converge. That's kind of urban planning 101. That's something every first grader should learn, but comes as such a surprise to us. All the other circles are kind of you know, on the block scale. They're indoor and outdoor gathering places. But you can see this community, which could be Celtic, it could be German, it could be Spanish, um, but it's actually it's derived from an aerial view of a Dogon village in Mali. It's expressive of a landscape that is 
you know, been basically geomorphically adapted. People living in the place have created an, uh, an adaptation to climate that is culturally expressive. It's been generated by the place-based community who lives there. Let's go on to the next image, which is basically a, it's a mycelial network. This is an image of the fibers underlying a forest floor within um, a mycelial network, which is associated with mushrooms, mushrooms being the fruit that's expressed on the surface. I'm showing this following that village plan because it's really working the same way. It's basically a network of information and nutrients you know, that travels under the forest floor, literally intelligently sending um, water and nutrients to distress plants if necessary. And at the uh, crossing of the fibers, these are nodes where information is also exchanged. I think this says a lot. Um, it basically says that when we act in accord and we morph ourselves to the climate and the geography, pay attention to the, to the conditions that we're growing within, that we actually can be in accord and live um, harmoniously with ecological principles. Next image is an aerial view of the Piazza del Campo in Siena. That's just an aerial view of a geomorphic village made out of locally available materials. This is the stuff we save our money by the thousands and try to set aside enough time to go visit in the world, like must go to place, must leave placelessness, you know, and go somewhere where I can see people interacting and uh, having a strong sense of identity with the ground they stand on. Um, we pay a lot of money to go see this, and then we come back you know, thinking we have to work and save money to go visit a culture again. Like, why aren't we coming back to geomorphically expressed patterns? Next image of a bench, uh, a typical bench in Portland, Oregon, between the Willamette River, which is basically Zero Street, and 360th Avenue. This is the only bench all along the way just for sitting. Um, and I think this is emblematic of the plight in the United States, it's typical. Like, just to have a place to sit is a rare thing, rare commodity in our experience. Again, we're not generating the landscape. It's created by developers and politicians for us to consume. You know, as we work for the class that we're basically buying the house from, we work 30 years just to pay for shelter which is a relationship, incidentally. I don't, I don't know if I need to point that out to anybody, that nobody ever negotiated or ever voted on that we would transition from um, place-based communities that determine these, these patterns ourselves and orchestrate the economy ourselves to something that feels out of control and in which we feel so frequently powerless. So the rarity of a bench like this um, should strike us uh, and cause us to notice but it's become so normal in this country, most people don't even think about it. Next image uh, is an aerial view of a very dense housing condition. This is, I think it's Philadelphia. Um, all right, this is great. You know, you're not consuming farmland. You're, you're living more densely. You probably have a shorter distance between where you live and work, you know, if you work somewhere within walking distance. Um, but this is actually a, vision, a view of a housing zone. Just like suburban housing zones, or semi-urban housing zones, much more urban housing zones like this, are generated as a product for consumption. People leave during the day to go to the work zone, not realizing that they live in a home zone and they have to go to the work zone as a function of the design of their civic environment in which they see themselves as citizens. You know, we're adding more and more people to the mix. We're, you know, with growth boundaries, we're trying to hold the line, you know, add more people infill in the urban environment, you know, saying, well, we must grow, we must grow, we must grow. But at the same time, we're not adding infrastructures um, of interaction nor gathering places, which means the pressure builds and issues compound. You know, where is the local self-empowerment? Where is the places? Where are the places for engagement? But more fundamentally, around places of engagement, you have engagement. You have nested cultures of people who actually identify with that location and then functionally have power. But in the American context, so infrequently does that happen. Next, we're looking at a monopoly board. This was invented by Lizzie Maggie as a way for Americans and Canadians to play the National Land Ordinance of the USA and the Dominion Land Survey that mandated the imposition of the Roman colonial grid over the entire continent, which happened in 1785. And Lizzie just wanted to point out 
like as you play the game, you kind of figure it out. You know, the only form of commons is a jail and a parking lot. And as you build houses, once you have enough money, you tear them all out in order to put in hotels. So you're actually playing gentrification. This is actually how the the construct of the National Land Ordinance is designed to work. Um, constant dis sort of disruption and sort of not really reinvestment, but destruction and then um, remaking as the fabric of place um, you know, is not necessarily valued. And then really, literally, everything on this board is for sale, all the streets and public utilities and railroads. And this is what Lizzie was trying to say. Um, it actually started out being known as the landlord's game. Um, so it was a little bit of a subversive game to raise awareness. OK, next image is of children working with the street intersection model. Um, we asked them to try to solve some epidemic or endemic problems in the urban environment, like how would you slow traffic? How would you make a place for gathering? How would you engage youth? How would you make the streets safer? And these little girls looked at us like, really? You're asking us? You can't figure this out? So they're talking here about an ice cream parlor in the middle of the intersection and tables and some chairs on all the corners. There's a little bit of an archway and a huge community skateboard there in the red clay. Um, and they're, they've basically done what the greatest designers in the history of the world do with great gathering places. They create animated edges which you know, accommodate people as they sit and participate in the theater of life. And then there's a functional center with something really attractive happening that you know, compels people to come to the space, not just for ice cream in this case, but to see and meet other people. So we know how to do this. It's just like a bird making a nest. Human beings know how to do it. But if you know, you know, if you send children off every day to learn stuff without really being mentored, and you send parents away to do stuff that doesn't really benefit their community, you know, as a way of trying to make a livelihood, you engender this disconnect so that the place making, the integrative place making behaviors in children does not get cultivated. And I'm afraid to tell people who aren't familiar with colonial history that this is a function of the very design that we live in. Um, how do you make a landscape that supports patriarchy perpetually if you don't isolate and regiment people? I don't know if anybody's hanging up at this point, but this is really, really important to understand, absorb, and then you know, see as part of the context that we're addressing, because this is, this is why we have to transition. You know, after all this time, why are we not a sustainable culture? After all the work, all the love, all the births, all the you know, marriages, you know, all the promises that have been made, and the working class mostly keeps, why, is it, why are we where we are now? Next image is actually of an aerial view of a Dogon village in Mali. So you can see all these circular structures. Those circular structures are block prototypes. Notice that in the middle, there's open spaces. Because this place-based community is generating its own patterns, over time, they're saying, well, we need gathering places everywhere. We obviously want to talk and work together. We've got all these needs to meet. We've got all these ideas to share. We've got you know, a little bit to work with and a lot of energy. Um, we're going to need to know each other. So they prioritize themselves mostly because you know, they would never abide someone coming in and say, no, 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 now you all work for someone else. You all have to leave during the day. Send your grandparents away to you know, homes to pass away alone and your children off to be taught by someone you don't even know. Like you would have to kill these people as you as someone did to our own ancestors when I'm talking about Western and Eastern European people. That's what happened. That's why we have to transition now. Next image. Chessboard. This is kind of another emblem of what we're talking about. Get off the get off the couch. Get out of the house. Realize you're in a grid and disconnected and isolated alienated, feeling alone. Instead, try out a different shape. Say hello to people all around you. And then you'll find that there's more help than you could possibly ever ask for um, all around you um, with everyone feeling so alone, even though, even though they live among millions or thousands of people. So this is a little emblem of what, we're, what we've got to do. You know, I mean, we've got to do all these things to reduce our carbon footprint for sure, to engender stronger you know, local agriculture systems for sure. But we need to have a shared impulse that we can do it um, in order for it to happen. And we need places to be able to talk about it. Next, um, you're looking at an image of Pioneer Square, the day that we actually painted the rooftop of the square against the power of the mayor and the city council, where the mayor was saying, you can't do this. You don't have the power. 
if we let you do this, it'll facilitate a revolution. And we were like, oh, that's such an awesome idea. Keep painting everyone. You can see that we even painted his car there um, in the image. And it became Pioneer Square, the first major public square built in the country since the 30s when a lot of public places were closed because people were using them to protest, get more time for their families, safer working conditions and things like that. I think I should sprint ahead to a few more images. These are just looking at images of Portland, Oregon. You see all these bikers, mass transit systems, historic preservation, green buildings, farmers markets. We've got more than 50 farmers markets in the city, the most bike lane miles, the most bike commuters by far. Our regional transportation network is definitely the model for the country. The first streetcar system built in the last 50 years, the most green buildings per capita by far. Um, and this is all having to do with Portlandia, frankly, the idea that we own our place, that we are our place. We are villagers here. Next image is of corn in a front yard. Shortest distance between where food is grown and where it's consumed in the country. Strongest local food systems. You know, all this is nascent in a way. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's all over the place. But it's, you know, the thing is we've hit the critical mass. We're flying down the other side of a hill now. Um, we know that we can do it. Nobody's going to stop us. We've subverted the bureaucracy. They're totally on our side. The political leadership comes from the community. So um, we're definitely a model for everyone, and we know it. We're not just changing ourselves for our own sake. Everybody's paying attention now. Next image is of our growth boundary over the whole region, three counties all coming together to agree to contain growth in the tri-county region. There's a lot to say about that diagram, but it's about building density along transit routes and trying to grow infrastructure incrementally. If we must grow, then we'll grow like this, where we're constantly reinvesting in our cultural heritage that we've already generated, so keeping our urban centers robust. Not perfect, but pretty freaking great as a start. Next image, a whole lot of naked people on bikes. This, to me, is the most beautiful thing. I, I totally invite you all to come to Portland in July where we will set, yet again, another world record for the most naked bike riders in the streets. And um, the mayor, the city council, the police, all the businesses are completely excited about this because it fills the hotels and restaurants. You know, but for everybody else, it's like, yeah, let's see what freedom actually means. Let's build a little community tonight. Um, you know, after the, after, the, after the bike ride of more than 20,000 people, everyone's dancing in the streets. Um, most of the conservatives are standing there with their clothes still on, and most of the wild-eyed radicals are, are in the streets dancing. Anyway, this is an expression of an impulse, um, of a power, of a confidence, of a creative culture. I should say about our music scene, um, people are saying it's like nothing ever seen before in the world, and the music and the, and the artistic epiphany is also through the roof. Um, the culture, entrepreneurial creative culture is... Um, just such a dense, broad concentration of people. Next image you're looking at is uh, of, a, of an experiment. Speaking of creative culture, one of the founding employees of Microsoft has generated this biodynamic permaculture farm, which is um, a strong, new, huge complement to the urban agriculture initiative in Portland. The beautiful thing is all the food grown here through mostly perennial systems only goes to Portland, Oregon. There's a lot to say about this, um, but it's a cooperative structure. Um, an just endlessly resourced benefactor that's getting it up and running and then working with his network of moneyed benefactors to get more of this happening. So, you know, sort of like Joseph Campbell said, at the darkest moment there will be a light, and we're sort of seeing the lights popping up everywhere in all directions. The village center on the left of this image shows um, passive solar straw bale, high-performance straw bale and cob buildings, so modeling some really stellar architecture here. Uh, next image is of the actual the design office where I'm actually sitting right now, where you can see that there's more than 75 varieties of edibles all around our design office on um, thin strips of on these planting edges. But basically, vertical for, uh, gardens, food forests. We've got about six layers between the ground cover and actually, in some cases, tubers under the ground um, up to the top of the fruit trees. Let's see. Next image. Uh, now we're looking at um, people gathering, talking, discussing rather animatedly, uh, and then an image of a circle on the grid. This is basically the strategy that we decided to undertake in the first neighborhood, where people realized, oh my gosh, we live in this grid. It's placeless. We're all frustrated and feel powerless, and this, these lines have been drawn you know, aggressively over Native people, and not just 
Native Americans, but of all of our ancestors. That was kind of this hundredth monkey moment we had. So we said, all right, well, let's put the circle back. The circles of our ancestors will reemerge, um, overlaid over the grid. So that's where you're seeing, you know, indigenous place-based settlement patterns reimposed over the grid that so violently obscured the, you know, thousands of years of pathways and gathering places that pre-exist the grid in every case. So we did it as an initiative, um, but we were also trying it out as an experiment. The next image shows people um, networking. They're actually connecting dots on a, a, a resource inventory grid, um, talking about what people do in their respective, uh, where, the, where they live. So like there's an electrician on the corner there, there's an auto worker, there's a cook, there's a chef, and everyone's kind of sitting around the table, all these adults connecting the dots, like, oh my gosh, we all eat. You know, we, we might want to know the chef. There's uh, a teacher. We, we like to learn. There's a dancer. We like dancing. There's a doctor. We all get sick. And the image on the right shows after five minutes all of these different connections that have been made all across the neighborhood. Um, and then throwing in the st stay-at-home parents and the kids, uh, it becomes absolutely black. And at that point, everyone realizes, oh my gosh, we're villagers. We live in the grid. We've got to connect with each other if we want to localize and you know, experience a little democracy or, or anarchy or whatever you want to call it. Next image. Taking over the street, this is without permission, people dancing in the street holding hands. Uh, what's happening there is they got fed up with the city government telling them no. They said, you know, the city government said, you can't do that, it's never been done. And we said, well, it's been done all throughout the history of the world. Um, now it's time to happen here. So we wouldn't take no for an answer. We took the street intersection and painted it. You can see all these little interactive features around the corners, either built or under construction. and. Uh, the police loved it, transportation loved it, but kept, they kept saying, you know, you can't do this, you don't have the power. And we're like, well, look, we have, here it is, have a seat, Here's, have some tea. And then the city council legalized it for everyone in the city to do as many times as people want for free all over the place. Um, anyway, next image, um, people dancing in the streets. They're actually being criminals there. I know they look like villagers, but they're actually, uh, they've been breaking the law this morning and afternoon. But, you know, that's what you have to do. The, if, if somebody tells you you can't do the barn raising anymore, you need to look them in the eye and say, oh, yeah, and know that there's a line that you're about to step over, not just for you, but for them, too, because they've obviously lost their minds. Um, so, you know, da painting the streets or whatever your project is, reclaiming the commons, dancing together, realizing you're part of a greater whole and, a, and an enduring, undying life force. Um, eating together, waking up the next day, feeling like you're more powerful than you ever imagined. Next image, truck with wings. Um, so we noticed that the corporate media wasn't telling everybody what had happened um, to legalize intersections and transform streets into gathering places. So we decided to take the message out via these um, series of mobile, um, basically free chocolate cake, uh, I don't know, rhubarb pie, blackberry pie, all sorts of different things, but serving mostly chai and tea all over the city, um, in the heart of the city, all around the perimeter, all through the inner city neighborhoods. Uh, let's see, next image shows people standing together, holding hands, spanning bridges in a 6.2 mile loop all around the inner city of, of Portland. Basically what happened was the mobile tea houses went kind of everywhere, demonstrating how you can create a sense of place. These canopies, you know, that would come off the truck would create shelter for people to sit on Persian rugs and pillows. And then the back of the truck would serve all the free drinks and desserts that neighbors would bring. That brought so many people together that they were excited, and they decided to reclaim their city, standing together in public space, linking together in the north and south and east and west parts of the city. Um, you know, and this was a way of answering Noam Chomsky's challenge, where he says, you know, when are we going to stand together without having to pay admission, you know, to watch other people smash each other. When are we going to get together by the thousands and actually do something that changes the world for free, where it doesn't cost anything, it doesn't create any pollution or, you know, excess? So we thought, all right, no. So how, how about this? So here you see people standing together around the city. Next images: um, children standing in street intersections, picking up stuff from the pinata that they've just burst open. See, one of the things about doing the, doing these street projects is you start to realize, this is, a, and I'll say the craziest thing right now, we realize streets aren't even for cars. Before cars existed, there were things that people did 
that we don't do anymore, like birthday parties in the streets, like puppet shows in the streets, like kids playing and shooting arrows at straw bales, you know, creating projects, having cultural celebrations, community dances, movie nights, um, you know, so many things that if you give up that space to cars, you know, that much less do you talk and that much more are you susceptible to being told what to do because you feel isolated. And then your children don't know how fundamentally connected they are to each other, especially through the, you know, functional, symbolic public commons. Um, in this case, our public commons isn't just a social space. It's also just infused with life and food and gardens. And all of it is expressive of the participation of the people there. So these kids are being, you know, future leaders. We, we actually mentor children simply by getting them into a birthday party out in the commons. The mentoring just happens naturally as they participate in a new context. Next image, people standing together holding hands all around an intersection yet again. Um, this is what streets are for, more than anything. You know, I don't know how much longer we're going to be driving cars, but this is something that we will always need to do. Um, some people say that the most powerful effect of the public commons is symbolic. It isn't even its function, you know, to accommodate something like this, like where people can make community announcements or sing happy birthday to each other, you know, or dance together. It's how it affects your dreams, your sense of identity wherever you go. Like if somebody's asking you to make a decision or a choice that insults your soul, you can think back to the place where you feel your power, and then you say no to that condition. You know, you say no to doing something that is destructive in the world because you feel like you're part of something stronger and greater. You got backup. You got turf. Next image is of people sort of running wild and dancing in that space. This is what streets are for. You know, for the transition movement, we need to see outside of our own doors and realize that there is this nexus where we'll find the juice to change the culture, you know, as we seek to do it. Um, no amount of policy change is going to make it happen. No, there is not enough money in the world to leverage to make stuff happen that only we can do right where we live. And we need to be practicing this in order to get better and better at it. Next, you're looking at a plan of a typical block. You're seeing purple circles around the perimeter. Okay, so when you're practicing indigenous sort of style placemaking, you have to remember a few things that come to us from Kevin Lynch and his book, The Image of the City, that he distilled by looking at native cultures. We need a fabric of gateways, pathways, nodes of interaction, places of memory um, that add up to a fabric of place. So here you're, here you're seeing purple circles where this block is saying, that's, that's just adjacent to our favorite intersection. And they're saying, all right, we need some gateways all around the perimeter. Next image shows a network of pathways where people say, you know what, I'm some sick of tired of always, of always just traveling straight lines and turning 90 degree angles. How about some curves? How about thinking of pathways as journeys, as destinies that lead from those gates to a common center in the middle of the block? Next image shows not just a red sort of field in the center of the block around a beautiful magnolia tree that becomes the village tree, but there's also this program of spaces beginning where you see like a play space, a tool library, um, a community meeting house, a market, a tree house, a hot tub, a sauna, a sacred space, and a lot more, like literally more and more. What's happening here in this, this is actually a model of real stuff happening on this real block in Portland, Oregon, next to that real intersection I just showed you, where people are saying, oh my gosh, we always leave where we live to go consume culture like to go somewhere else for a sauna, to go somewhere else for a community meeting house, to go somewhere else to go to the library. And instead, why can't we just generate that here and then inhabit it? Why can't we you know, blur these lines, take down these fences, put in ways of connection, and then you know, inhabit this as villagers once again, make our children safe, you know, create a vision of a, of a common future together. Next image shows lots of green, dark green and light green. Annual gardens and um, food forests, um, rain gardens, all sorts of things going on where you're sort of intentionally transforming lawns into productive um, planes of fruitfulness. Um, next image, oh, yeah, that's the Chicken Palace. Um, that's in the center of the block. That's an actual project. The left image is of um, a chicken coming up a spiral stair. And then on the right, um, the chicken sitting on the front porch. I'm afraid we might be running out of time, so I need to just quickly go through this. The next image is of people 
taking a typical grass strip in our neighborhood and putting in a 150 foot long first sort of stage of the succession of a food forest. The image on the lower right is of a spot food forest going in on an existing lawn where somebody just wanted to take up that much space. It's all being done by neighbors. Next image shows our concept for um, creating a watershed on our own block so the water will flow from the high part of the block to the low part. Um, sort of collecting water from rooftops as if the houses are analogous to mountains and then all the water collecting through a common sort of river valley punctuated by bodies of water along the way. Next image shows that we've installed cisterns, constructed wetlands, and perimeter swales. We're actually looking at a complete system. We like to think this is what world peace looks like from a water systems design perspective on a local level. But this is what you're looking at transition folks. You know, we're not just doing something independently in your own homestead, but where you're acting as a village together in common cause. You know, and creating more than you could possibly ever need and, you know, possibly ever utilize or have accumulate individually. Next, whoa, total build out. All the south facing planes and west facing planes have solar hot water and solar electricity, some green roofs and some wind power. You can also see that the people on the block are actually imagining that they're taking over the streets around the perimeter of the model, wiggling the streets, narrowing them to access lanes, but putting in a lot more space for gardens, so a lot of depaving going on. Next image, you're looking at little girls painting legally on the street, not needing to run from the cops because it's legal in our town. And then an image of the entire city being transformed. So this is how we transform all other cities. We transform our city um, focusing on the social fabric as our primary you know, kind of product of impact and everything else that we do as a means toward that impact. A uh, set of circles and circles. That's actually a diagram for the um, transformation of the city as a whole politically. Um, we actually do have 96 neighborhood associations that actually are now connected to seven coalitions of power that are all now connected very directly to city council. And um, the transformation is only a couple of years away from um, being a context where people go from their deeds at the most grassroots level up through the system and being elevated one level to the next through their real actions by their real peers. So um, it's incredible. And this is what our city is going to be doing and talking. Well, it's, already, it's, it's what we're already talking about, the visitors that come here from all over the world to find out what we're doing. Next image uh, is of a small town on the Oregon coast, and this is where we're applying the same principles, but through a participatory process in Bay City, Oregon, funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. Funny how you sit down with a place-based group, you start to talk about reinventing, and we don't even need to provide the ideas to them. The intelligence, the resident intelligence of their own place, finally being unleashed, came up with all of the stuff you're looking at in this plan, which has to do with linking everything together you know, crossing the divide of Highway 101, restoring the ecology of Tillamook Bay, reclaiming the jetty, putting in local microenterprises, and a, an entirely walkable, talkable landscape um, that's a reflection of an indomitable culture. Next, last image. This is Elizabeth, grew up in our neighborhood, um, always there to come back and paint the street. Um, a vital person who's able to say yes and hello, um, help people. And um, I think that, you know, among all the things that we're thinking about, certainly involving children um, and creating a new capacity, or, you know, in, new gen in next generations for leadership um, has to be integral to everything that we do. Um, it's very holistic. We have to be thinking as a holistic ecology in order to accomplish not just, you know, all of it, but any of it. Um, any individual piece will only be sustainable if we look at the thing holistically and do as much as we can at once, you know, stacking as many functions as we can. Um, so I'll stop there. I, I hope I haven't exhausted all of our time. Mark, thank you. Wow, um, lovely images. They say so much, and everything that you've shared is so valuable to the transition work, um, which we're all involved in, right? We're all trying to transition our places to more resilience. So thank you so much. Um, we have time for a few uh, questions or comments. So those of you um, on the call, if you press 1 on your keypad, if you have a comment or a question for Mark. Um, go ahead, ahead, Michelle. 
Hello. Hi, this is Michelle. I'm calling from Anchorage, Alaska right now. Um, I actually live in Kenai, Alaska, a town of about maybe 8,000 people. Um, so I'm excited about this stuff. I really want to do it. I'm having a hard time conceptualizing what happens in a place that has a lot of winter like we do. And um, we don't. I feel like we don't have a lot of that common space. Um, we, you know, we obviously have rights of way in our roadways that are a few feet wide. Um, but picturing building structures for gathering, I can't see them surviving the snow plows. What have you seen this happen in places with with long winters like I've got? Well, Minneapolis, St. Paul has almost as many as Portland now, and they certainly qualify with uh, heavy winters. Um, and also, it's happening in upstate New York. Actually, uh, there's a lot going on in Toronto right now. I'm I haven't gotten images yet, but the Trillium Foundation there, which is government-funded, is working with indigenous communities to do this kind of work in the northern part of their province. I can say, though, that you know it's one thing to take over an intersection, but there's a lot of complementary pieces, like these little self-service libraries that people put on corners, for instance, um, just places to sit with maybe a roof over the top of it, um, places for information. Um, you know. There are small and large things that can be done. Um, I think in a place like yours, I would certainly be thinking about a space that is both indoor and then at the best of times outdoors, um, where you're adapting public space to be able to work all through the year. Um, obviously, when you're dealing with snow plows and deep snow um, and then really you know cold conditions, it's a little bit trickier. But I don't think it makes anything impossible. I just think it makes your solutions more um, site-specific or culture-specific. Great. Um, thank you, Mark, for that. Any other questions or comments? We could probably take one more. Um, seeing none, Mark, <laughs> which, uh, brings us right to time. And uh, would love to have you on again, maybe as you uh, do you get some other images from uh, more more places that you're working in or, or have something new to, to tell us? That would be great. And just some um, closing comments on your end, uh, and then we'll just wrap it up for today. So a closing comment, Mark? Sure. Well, let's see. I suppose I should give you um, some contact information in case people want to see more. Uh, in fact, we do this national training every year at the end of May and the beginning of June called the Village Building Convergence. And um, the dates for that this year, I believe, are Friday, May 24th or 25th, something like that, um, going to June 2nd. So it's about 10, 10 days, and there's a village building design course that people could take, or they could just come and attend the 10 days of this community building sort of placemaking festival. Uh, and I think. You know, the way that we define placemaking is basically it's not really going to add up to a place unless people have integrated everything that they know and can see through their own kind of local economy of getting things done, making decisions and, re and sourcing materials. And in the end, the little, the little thing that they make is a, is, a, is a way of practicing how to build a more integrative, better world. I mean, small things, large things, medium-sized things that talk about issues that are so gigantic they're beyond any scale and people can take these as a way of practicing design or you know creativity in their own communities. So you could come to Portland for that and you can learn more about it at cityrepair.org. Um, if you come to Portland to be part of this, you'll probably be participating among 40 projects going on simultaneously all across the city for 10 days, 40 to 50. We had 41 last year. You can also go to planetrepair.org and learn about our local homestead project on that very block I just showed everybody. And then you can go to communitexture.net, which is our um, design office. That's C-O-M-M-U-N-I-T-E-C-T-U-R-E dot -E -E net. Um, yeah, and, there, and you can find out all sorts of like larger scale um, design projects that are pretty outrageous. Mark, I want to thank you so much for joining us today.